All right. Um, so hopefully Kenneth will join in soon. I'm Chayla Mitchell. I am an art advisor at my own practice, which is Chayla Mitchell Art Advisory. I'm based in New York City. I am also the founder of Kamuna, which is a global arts club centered around artists and people of color. I want to welcome you to our chat today with 154. Thank you for having us. This chat centers around, this webinar centers around the future of art collecting. Um, and I have some panelists here with me, and I would love for you to introduce yourself. Um, I'll start with um, Pulani, can you introduce yourself? Hey, my name is Pulani uh, Kingston. I am based in Johannesburg. Um, I am an art enthusiast. Thank you. And Sandra? So my name is Sandy Obiago. I'm um, based in Lagos, Nigeria. And um, I um, am a collector. And I also work in the art space. I uh, run a, a small um, art um, platform called SMO Contemporary Art. And um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you so much to 154 and um, to Chala and of course to Pulane and um, Kenneth when he joins us. So it's, it's really a great honor to be here with you today. No, agreed. It's a wonderful honor. I appreciate you all for joining. You look great. Um, and um, still waiting for Kenneth, but I do have a question that um, we could get started with until he joins. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what we were just discussing about, you know, borders closing. Um, Africa thrives on mobility, correct? And I just wanted to know how the recent closing of borders has impacted you and your business and the way you collect. Do you want to start, Sandra? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I think that <clears throat> we've all been um, very much affected by COVID and, um, and the lockdown. Um, and with borders closing, I think we've all started to look more inwards, um, looking for solutions, um, trying to help out um, with the difficulties during lockdown, um, where a lot of um, people um, could not, you know, earn their daily wage and were very, you know, um, badly affected. And uh, we saw a lot of um, people pulling together to try to help with um, with uh, uh, projects um, to try to meet the needs of the basic needs of Nigerians. Um, even the art community, there were quite a lot of grants that were being um, given to artists. Hi, can I yeah. oh, um, Apologies, technical difficulties, sorry about that. Hi. No You're welcome. Hey, hey. Welcome. Apologies. Nice to see everyone. Sorry Hi, Kenneth, how are you? Hey, hey. <laughs> what's up, Kenneth, would, oh. would you mind if um, I let Kenneth um, introduce himself and you can, um, get back to speaking because I was really engaged in what you were saying. Kenneth, yeah. can you introduce yourself to yeah. um, everyone joining us today? And thanks for joining us. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Sorry to be a little late. Um, Kenneth Montague, I'm based in Toronto. Um, I'm coming to you from my home office here. Uh, I am the director of Wedge Curatorial Projects, which is a nonprofit arts organization that I founded almost 25 years ago. And it's really about celebrating, promoting, supporting black artists globally. Uh, and the increasing focus is on our small but very vibrant African Canadian art community. So that's Wedge in a Nutcell. It started in my home in a wedge shaped space and it's kind of a double entendre, you know, wedging artists into the mainstream. And um, we're at a great moment and uh, I'm also a collector uh, with my wedge collection. I've been trying to kind of um, center and focus, you know, on the many stories uh, globally 
but again, locally uh, with regard to uh, the African uh, continent and the diaspora. So uh, I work also as a dentist in Toronto, and so it's a kind of a strange double life, but I've been collecting for many years. Uh, I was part of the uh, original Tate African Acquisitions Committee, where I stayed for about five years, and that was a, a wonderful experience. And then now I'm a, a, a member of the AGO board, the Art Gallery of Ontario here in Toronto. And um, we are working hard to sort of uh, move everything forward institutionally and, um, and also with, with fellow collectors. So I'm really pleased to be here today and have a long relationship with Turia and the 154 Art Fair. So uh, thank you again. Wonderful. Um, before you joined in, um, we had Sandy um, speaking to a question of mine about Africa thriving on mobility and how um, borders closing has impacted her, her business, and the way that she collects. Back to you, Sandy. Thank you. Yeah, so I think during this COVID, um, I think we have as a nation become very much concerned about the state of healthcare um, and the need to, to support um, people across, across all sectors who are, have been affected by, by COVID and um, both economically, physically, um, through their health. Um, and of course, I was mentioning that um, a number of initiatives have also been started um, to support artists during this time. For example, the Nelele um, Institute has given grants to artists. Um, Victor Hikamenor's um, Angels and Muse have provided a platform for um, presenting artists and helping them to promote themselves. Um, and I think that we've sort of looked at two, two realities. One, which is that technology is gonna be a big way of reaching the market and of collecting um, technology oriented um, um, ways of access to the market. And so we as an organization, um, SMO is sort of uh, an organization which came out of um, the, the collection of my husband and I, Joe and I um, started collecting um, as young, as young uh, um, professionals. He was a banker, I was a journalist, and um, he had a lot more um, disposable income. And so he started really, you know, trying to collect some of the greats. But I think the basis of the collecting was very much um, born out of um, personal relationships. So um, he, um, his father went to school with Ben and Wangwu. And um, that, that of course was a, a, an incredible uh, friendship and he would spend time in his studio. And um, over the years we've built relationships with artists, um, many modernists um, across, across the continent, also contemporary artists. So during this time of COVID, um, it's been important to sort of look at the sustainability of, of the art practice, um, both in terms of artists as well as, um, as art businesses, and also pulling together um, as a community of collectors and seeing how we can um, provide support to, to, to each other, but also to, to artists in particular. Absolutely. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add? Okay. Um, um, I can just add, I think um, from a South African perspective, I'd like to paint a picture because I think the picture of where we find ourselves in the context of COVID and its impact has a direct correlation on, on the state of the art industry in South Africa. It's just going to take me a few minutes. So I think firstly is to point out that as we sit here today, there are 13.3 million confirmed cases globally of the, of the virus. Uh, 580 of those um, have resulted in deaths. 
And then when you uh, break that down into a from a continental perspective, South Africa has the highest, is the highest affected African country um, in the context of the pandemic. We have 298 cases which have been confirmed and we have just over 4,000 deaths. Um, we haven't yet reached our peak. We are at a dramatic surge um, and our peak should come in the next one to three months, which means that at this point in time, we are dealing with approximately 10,000 um, new cases a day, which is scary and it means that people have got to um, observe um, social distancing, staying at home, wearing of masks, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there's a real health issue at stake. And I think because we're now starting to, it, it's now clear that we know people who are not only affected, but who died as a consequence of the, of the pandemic, the reality of it is finally settling in months later. Um, we went into lockdown on the 26th of, of March and in that time, South Africa, there have been uh, 2 million jobs that have been lost. The levels of unemployment, broad unemployment, are at 45%, which is absolutely dramatic. Um, because what this does is it magnifies the levels of inequality in, in society. So perhaps I will sit on a yacht um, during the time of lockdown, but the vast majority of South Africans are in shacks. Uh, dealing with issues, real issues of, of, of hunger. Um, the economy is set to shrink by 10% in 2020. Um, and, and, and taking all of that into account, when you then look at uh, travel restrictions, borders closing, what this means is that uh, not only do we have an economic um, crisis at hand uh, to deal with over and above uh, the pandemic, um, the, this, the economic picture that I've painted um, flows through to the art, to the art industry. Um, and, and given that the South African art industry is active, um, but dare I say active in the context of, your, of the independent and private institutions, more so than the government institutions or government-sponsored institutions, um, we're seeing, um, an, uh, um, we're pivoting to seeing a pivoting to um, online and technology related ways of communicating and of keeping in touch and of, uh, of seeing uh, new works of art or being able to buy new works of art if that is, 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 what, if that is what we want to do. But what I do want to say about that is that from a collector's perspective, this is very new. Um, one is used to being able to see artwork, to engage with it, to see whether or not it, its power draws you um, in real life. And all of a sudden you are confronted with a situation where um, the best you can do is hope for superior technology which enables you to then reflect on whether you want to collect a particular work of art or not. And um, the other part to this story, of course, is the fact that one ends up uh, focusing on artists that you know. There's, there's, there's limited um, appetite for experimentation, simply because you almost know what you'll get um, from the artists that you already have begun collecting or that you know. And there's a heavier reliance, I would say, on substantive conversations with gallerists, um, which is where most of us buy, buy our work, around the works of art. And there's more which is a good thing. There's more of a, of a move towards really taking one's time around researching, around engaging uh, the artwork before uh, choosing to, to acquire the artwork or, or otherwise. Oh my goodness, thank you for that. Um, I didn't think about, from a collector standpoint, the familiarity aspect. Um, yeah, I didn't think about that. Definitely buying from people that you already know, artists that you've already supported, because, you know, viewing art on a PDF and in person is two totally different experiences. But yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing those stats as well. They're so, that, that's so sad what's happening. And this is kind of happening globally, you know? So, um, 
we appreciate collectors like you who are still able to pour into um, the art world and the art economy um, because you all are helping artists thrive and survive right now. Okay. Um, so we've witnessed quite a few cancellations of some of our favorite art fairs. What do you miss the most about attending these fairs? Well, uh, Kenneth here, I, I will say um, being in Canada, uh, far away from the action, might we say, uh, on the continent, uh, I, I'm used to um, kind of making sure, ensuring that I get to uh, global fairs that are on the calendar just as a chance, not so much to buy art. I find that it's about seeing planting seeds, uh, rekindling relationships, meeting new artists. Um, and so going to that freeze fair in London or New York or going to 154, um, it's been a kind of uh, annual and, and now with 154 in various locations, it's become a kind of a within the year, it's sort of on my calendar, I make sure to get there. Um, so that, that, that hurts a bit because online um, you're seeing essentially the same works, but not experiencing it uh, in the same way. And I find that as a collector, it's a very visceral thing. And for me, one of the most important aspects of collecting is actually meeting the artist, doing the, the, the studio visit. And so what I've done, my personal pivot has really been around focusing on um, black artists in Toronto and in Canada. So I've done a lot more studio visits. Uh, you know, I recently bought a painting after spending, uh, you know, a whole afternoon with, you know, one of our emerging uh, artists, Gordon Shadrach uh, in Toronto. It was pretty wonderful to be able to, you know, put your mask on both of us and kind of do our proper self distancing, but, you know, social distancing. And, and but it's, it's also great to be in person to get the nuance uh, from the artists about the work, the backstory. Um, I find, the studio visits a, a kind of invaluable way of um, getting to know the, the artist and um, kind of getting a richer story behind the artwork. So I miss that so much. Uh, the art fair is usually the beginning of that spark. Then I talk to the gallery, uh, get on the phone with the artist. Sometimes if it's within my purview, get on a plane and, and meet the person. But I spend a lot of time researching so in some ways, uh, I'll finish by saying in some ways, the change is not so great for me because you know having a focus of uh, global artists in the collection, I've always had to you know travel uh, you know near and far to kind of make those connections. So you know we move forward, but um, um, I, I just have to reiterate about the particular difficult moment for artists. The entire um, art world is affected um, by this. But if you think of it as a kind of a pyramid with so many artists on the bottom and you know a few uh, you know gallerists and then it moves to just a few collectors at the top, it's that huge part of the pyramid at the bottom that starts the whole engine. Artists have been terribly affected. I've heard some terrible stories. And I think we really need to work uh, hard as collectors in you know thinking of innovative ways. Sometimes it's just giving money and just making sure that artists uh, get through to the other side. We can't even say when that other side appears and what it's going to look like, but we can control the equation a bit by, at this moment, not taking but giving back. So I really think that's the ethos that I'm trying to work with as a collector. It's a time to reflect, a time to, um, you know, reconsider my own collection. We're actually working on a, a monograph now. Um, it's a time to hunker down and, and uh, think about, um, you know, your blessings and kind of uh, be thankful for what you've got. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, building on what Kenneth has said, that there is, um, you know, the noise has reduced. And so you have more time to reflect and Absolutely. to look inwards. Um, first of all, personally, um, you know, how, how we live our lives. I mean, Lagos is such a, a vibrant um, social scene. And so for, you know, there to be no invitations coming in and you're not stressed every weekend with, you know, 
having to go to all these um, openings and art events. It's, it's a time to reflect. Um, and I think it's a time for research as well. Um, building on what Kenneth has said, we've spent um, a lot more time online. And yes, you don't have the joy of when you're walking into a fair, meeting new people, having conversations, um, walking uh, by um, booths that you don't normally know or um, having a, 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 an opportunity to, to um, bump into a lot of new works that you may not have seen um, before. Um, when you are online, you're much more targeted. Um, but at the same time, um, it's given us also a chance to sort of look at the new trends globally with art and collecting, the interest that um, has been raised, um, especially on the online auction. Um, African art has done um, quite well. And we've seen, um, you know, um, collectors being very comfortable to, to buy online um, and seeing some really significant sales of, um, of art by, by um, people of color. And so that, that has been very exciting, sort of looking, looking at the trends. And yes, we too have done quite a lot of studio visits, more online. Um, so, um, you know, with technology, again, you can, you can link. I mean, yesterday I spoke to an artist in the UK and the day before in, in Lagos and, um, you know, the ability through Zoom. I think Zoom has made an incredible impact on how we, we communicate. Um, so I think that 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 has also been um, a way of um, of being technologically intimate, closer in a way. Even as a team, we've done a lot more discussions since the lockdown because we're all working remotely, um, and we've also, as a team, um, done a lot more strategic thinking and strategic planning. You know the whole concept of who move, who moved my cheese, um, what's happening in the art market really, and, and how are we going to, how are we going to, to, to be able to ensure that standards are kept? I mean, there's a whole also question about certification. If you, if you don't see the works, if you're not able to physically ascertain, you know, um, yes, you can buy works through Instagram, maybe that are not, um, as um, you know, as high in value, or you you buy from the the typical sources, the the auction houses that you you know that you're very well that are very well established. Um, but it's also showing the in the um, the inequalities that are in the art market and the fact that there isn't enough on the continent. Um, there are there are no major auction houses on the continent. Um, so, you know, Bonhams and Sotheby's, they are in New York and in, in, in Hong Kong and in, and in London, and they are they're presenting works um, from all across Africa, but there's none of them represented here on the continent. So just looking also at, at um, questions of access and accessibility, and that's something that um, SMO has been particularly focused on, um, you know, the democratization of art. And how do you um, ensure that more people have access to, um, to art? And of course, it also throws up issues around documentation and the fact that there isn't enough good documentation coming out of, I would say, 70% of artists working on the continent that are not, especially the older um, artists who are not as maybe as well documented um, and the need to really leapfrog with technology um, and tell more complete stories. And of course, with the Black Lives Matter movement, we're seeing that <laughs> the importance of telling our own stories in, in very authentic ways. So all those things have, have been in our minds as we have not had the, the, the very um, hectic travel schedule of going to Fez and actually starting to look deeper at um, systemic issues of, of equality, um, democracy, um, representation, um, and access. Thank you, Sandra.
If I can just add to what uh, both Sandra and Kenneth have said, um, I can't agree more with both of you, but just to add from, from, from my perspective, one of the, the other um, positives uh, around the fact that we can no longer go to art fairs is that, is that of education. Um, be it auction houses here in South Africa, be it art galleries, be it institutions which are privately owned, um, there has been a significant amount of engagement and communication. Every day, um, there are a whole variety of webinars or Zoom conversations that one can participate, participate in. Yesterday, for instance, I joined a Zoom uh, webinar or a webinar um, organized by the Goodman Gallery, which focused on um, Alfredo Jarre. He came on and spoke at length about his art practice and about um, the fact that he's hoping to come to South Africa in, in August for an exhibition at the Zeitzmoke. Um, the fact that we are now having to be, that we have time at home and we have time to think and to reflect means that we have time to understand more deeply what uh, drives the different artists, what the various levers are for a successful art market, um, what Africa needs to do a little bit more. And I know I, I generalize when I say <laughs> Africa, but what the main cultural capitals across the continent need to do in order to make sure that their own artists um, uh, continue to be relevant globally. Because what I have found is that over time, um, the art world is very faddish. So in two, two years ago, um, the interest in art was all about Chinese art. And in a time immediately before the, the pandemic hit uh, the world, um, African art was uh, the, fashion, the fashion art to collect or the art du jour. So um, this particular time I think is valuable because it is giving us pause for thought in terms of how we need to position ourselves, how collectors should be positioning, uh, positioning themselves. Um, in particular around the question of what you collect and how you go about collecting it, um, given the pyramid that Kenneth spoke to. Are we all now going to be focusing on your, um, on your uh, rock star artists um, and buy art from your mega galleries uh, across the globe, whether we've seen that artwork or not? Or are we going to be responsible Africans and say, right, let us look at this bottom end of the pillar uh, of the pyramid there is some talent, um, we need to try and support that talent so that um, whatever this afterworld looks like, um, those artists will be slightly um, more established. Um, I, I also, I also um, uh, make the point about the fact that this whole mobility where we all rushed to these cultural capitals, be it Basel or Miami or New York or London every year, or Hong Kong for that matter, Cape Town, Johannesburg, um, did something for the art world and artists that I couldn't quite um, wrap my arms around. And that was, what it did was it prevented the growth of a healthy and sustainable art market locally and regionally. And I really do hope that uh, out of this comes a sense similar to Canada, where we begin to cultivate and grow uh, the, our own timber, uh, so that while it is important for us to ensure from an internationalization perspective that our art is inserted where it needs to be inserted from the perspective of ensuring that those artists um, end up in the canon of art history, that by the same token, we grow uh, our local domestic and regional markets. And you know we we are we have a we have a significant population on the continent, and I would like to believe that there are a lot more people, you know, African people, that could and should be contributing to the growth of this this sector. Um, for me, I don't see it as simply buying art for collection sake. I see it as primarily contributing to the preservation of South African culture of African culture. Yeah. Well you. said, well said. Well said, yes. Thank you, thank you everyone. I really love everyone's um, reactions and answers to that question. 
Um, so since we're on the topic of um, the art world operating differently, technology being a huge source of us being informed and learning more about art, I would love to know what is your preferred way to acquire art in the midst of the pandemic? Um, I know some of you touched on it, but just to, um, to let some of the people that are following us know um, what some of your preferred ways are. Um, are they directly working with galleries? Are, do you prefer to work directly with artists? Do you like a PDF in your email box, inbox in the morning? What is your preferred way of going about acquiring new artwork at this time? Well, I already mentioned that my preferred way always is to actually meet the artist if possible. Right. So the studio visit still is, is number one for me, just again, because of that intimacy. Um, I find that uh, it, my, my method would usually be, I saw the work uh, on some source, often social media, Instagram in particular. Um, I was told about the work by a fellow collector. I was um, given a PDF or sent something by a gallery that I work with over you know the years. In some way, I see something new. Um, I'll take a little bit of time to uh, observe, to research, but just a little bit at first. Just you know, maybe I'll Google the artists and see where they're at and see what what their their artistic statement is, and then. Uh, if I really like what I see, I'm always trying to, to meet that person. Sometimes I go through the gallery, of course, and uh, try to get that email or the telephone number because for me, it's a very personal thing. And um, uh, I'm not one of those kind of collectors that can just buy the work and not care about uh, the artist or the artist's story. I have to um, like the artist and want to work with them because I see this relationship that's going to be enduring. Um, when I started, it was a bit here, a bit there. As I move along, um, I, I've started to collect deeply with certain artists who I, I, I want to be on the journey with them. So I think that, that uh, you know, piece that I'm calling intimacy, this thing about meeting the artists. And in the case of, you know, um, uh, artist estates, it's to try to talk to the gallery and, and really go into uh, the writing that's out there and kind of learn more. So, you know, I really follow the same approach. It's about trying to get uh, the backstory as much as possible. So that's a little difficult in the times that we're in, um, obviously, but uh, I still, uh, in a sense, I've slowed down a bit on purchases and I'm spending a lot more time establishing and reestablishing relationships. I expect to, um, I haven't stopped buying, but I expect to uh, turn the volume up on that uh, in the months ahead. Right now, as we're all saying, there are just bigger concerns uh, globally, and I'm not pushing uh, the buying, but more trying to uh, broaden knowledge and support where I can. Absolutely. Um, I too love the personal touch. Um, just knowing something about an artist that you can't research on Google, you know, those little um, special facts about them or quirks about their personality. So I can see why you really like that personal one-on-one -on -one touch. Do you do virtual visits when you can't do a physical? Yeah, and, I, and I've been doing that before, again, being here in Canada. Um, I can re remember buying work from, um, uh, an artist uh, recently uh, from the continent, from uh, Morocco, and that was the way to go. It was just, uh, that was pre-COVID. Um, so <laughs> yeah, uh, again, yeah. <laughs> it, it's become a lot more ubiquitous, but I was already, uh, being in my little island here in, in Canada, I was already uh, kind of on that technology. But but it doesn't replace the the eye to eye, and I, I really look forward to, uh, you know, I don't know what the new normal will be, who can say, but I get that. I'm looking forward to getting back to, uh, you know, being able to shake a hand, embrace, you know, yeah. Agreed, agreed. 
Yeah, I think um, for us, we've been very much relationship driven and or oriented from the very beginning of our collection. But I think as you, as you grow older, you begin to realize that that you're not just collecting for yourself, but that you're a custodian. You're a custodian of history, and you're also collecting to represent a time, an era, and make sure that that era is represented in its entirety, or at least more fully. Um, and so we have been doing a, a lot of research. My, my husband is very research oriented. I'm a little bit more um, intuitive and um, you know, and I am I'm, I'm more of a of a free spirit when it comes to to collecting. But but the reality is that there is a whole slice of history that is becoming almost obsolete. Older artists are passing, and also older collectors. Um, over the last sort of few months not just with COVID, but even before, we've seen a lot of significant um, collect, you know, collectors of significant um, collections passing on without having documented their collections in a, in, a, in a very, very strategic way. And then the collection is kind of dismembered by the heirs. And that, and that is so mm. heartbreaking when that happens because it's like you're losing a whole library, a whole perspective on a particular, um, on a particular era, um, post-independence especially. Um, so we, we have been engaging with artists, a lot of older artists, people like Bruce and Abrakaya, like um, um, Demas and Woko, people who are in their 80s and, you know, and trying to, to get those stories documented in a, in a more... Um, in a deeper way. Um, so in terms of our collecting, um, yes, we've spent a lot more time researching, a lot more time reaching out to artists, um, and then also looking at our collection and seeing where are the gaps um, and, and where, where do we need to, to, to deepen, to deepen the, the narrative and the conversation. And particularly myself, I've been working a lot with corporate collections um, because we find that the corporate space is a very important space for presenting art uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sustainable and in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and so I've been working with um, two, two um, corporate collections uh, and with a collector who has loaned to a corporate collection. And again, talking about the democratization of art, trying to put art within spaces where people just walk through. They don't really expect to be, you know, um, to see a masterpiece, and when they do, um, that we provide them the information for them to learn more about um, the history and the significance of that work. So spending time documenting and also providing information in corporate spaces for their collection so that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's more of an educational experience. And then, of course, that will then lead to, to private museums, um, which there are not enough of. I mean, right now there's um, working with another collector who's building a museum in, in Eastern Nigeria, the, the Obi of Onitsha. Um, so so that, has, that has been, a, a, you know, front and center in our minds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so there's a global conversation that's happening. We kind of touched on this that is centered around not going back to normal, um, the art world changing and shifting forward. And that can be a good thing, in my opinion. Um, so kind of this reinvention, what are some things that you would like to see change within the art world and specifically within the African art market? Oh, if I can start just briefly, sorry, yeah. can, can go ahead. No, no, you, you go ahead, please. Um, <laughs> there are two things. In fact, I have quite a number of things that I'd like to see change. Um, from my perspective, one of the most important for me rests around the issue of art as an asset class. I 
happen not to be a proponent of that because I believe that one, there, there sometimes is a difference, there's a big difference between uh, buying art because you are drawn to it, uh, you're buying it for posterity's sake, you're buying it because it is important, the artist is important and will be important from a historic perspective relative to what the fad happens to be at the time that results in you spending all your money um, on, on, in the belief that uh, you can flip this art in a few, in a few years time. And I think it goes to the point that Sandra was making around the fact that as you grow older, what you're doing as you build a collection and or as you buy art is you're acting as a custodian to make sure that with future generations, they will look at your collection um, and uh, understand what was going on from a cultural perspective in the time that you lived. So, so I, would, I would like to see less of a focus around the issue of asset classes and how you, how you value art from a financial perspective to really taking a more, a, more, a more principled, I'd say, position around how one should, why one collects and why one builds, um, builds, uh, builds an art collection. The second is a, a point I made a little earlier about the interna internationalization of, of art. Um, I always ask myself, where, what, what do we mean when we call this, when we talk about this international art, art world? The reality is that we are part of the globe and we are as international in terms of situation and in terms of where we're positioned as any other country. But if we, and if we direct our attention and our focus appropriately, we will be seen to be international art centers as well, part of the international art world as well, in a serious a way as New York and London and Hong Kong and Miami may be considered today. So my sense around, um, uh, uh, our artists, especially those that um, are highly sought after and whose work will go into the art, in the, into the canon of art history, is that it is important from that perspective to ensure that their work is placed in museums globally, so that when visitors go to these museums, they have a diverse picture of, of the time in which we live. Um, I happen to sit on the acquisitions committee of the Tate, and I must say that I'm impressed with the fact that in terms of the Africa acquisitions, um, the focus has been just that. How do you, you know, where, how do you choose which artists are going to be inserted amongst Western artists, for instance, or Eastern uh, artists? So uh, um, a Picasso, for instance, or a Chagall, or a Calder, um, so that that art from Africa sits shoulder to shoulder with that art, not because favors are being done, but simply because our art is as good, if not better, and yeah. is a proper representation of that time. So for me, um, focusing on that is one of the things that I would like to see, to see happen, um, whether or not we are, we are more uh, mobile um, physically um, or not, because ultimately from an online perspective, people will still want to delve into the British Museum or delve into uh, MoMA in the States or, or, or any of the other, um, the Louvre in France. And so we need to make sure that our art is also part of those collections. Um, it's a different conversation to talking about how our art that was stolen needs to come back um, to, to, to the continent. Um, the other thing that I would like to see happen more was spoken up, was was talked to by 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 a writer called Bell Hooks, who's a feminist, and it, she talks about the importance of time, the importance of time to think and reflect. I think one of the things that this particular um, pandemic has has forced upon us is lots of time. Whether or not we are working hard in terms of our day jobs is immaterial. The fact of the matter is there is less rush in everything that we do. And I do believe that this is a great time for artists to sit back, reflect, and exercise greater creativity. 
um, uh, lest I am shut down, I do want to say that one of the things that I did find um, in the last couple of years was that there was less and less creativity. Artists created, and I'm speaking in general terms, what they felt that the market would buy. And I think this is a great opportunity for artists to also sit back and say, what, what am I really feeling here? Um, you know, uh, the last time I was at, um, at the Venice Biennale, I, I, I went with the, the owner of the Goodman Gallery, Lisa Essers, and we spoke a lot about the fact that we were foreseeing a spiritual renewal in the art world. And little did we know that this spiritual renewal would come in the form of a deadly, <laughs> deadly virus. But I think that I, I would like to see more of that and more of that reflected in, in how, in how we, we create art, in how we experience art. Um, I'm starting to see, I, I'd like to see, for instance, more and more abstract art, because what that, that, that does is, give, is it gives you uh, the space to imagine, the space to, to find your own uh, answers or ask your own questions um, in the context of, of, of those canvases that, that, that one finds from an abstract art perspective. And by the way, when I talk about abstract art, I don't mean uh, no figurative art. You know, I, I just mean art which is imagined, um, imagined art. Um, so somebody like a Lynette, um, uh, I, I think is an abstract artist because the, the portraits are of people that I imagined. They're not mm -hmm. of people that, that she knows or, or we know. So those, those are the things that I, I would like to see. Obviously, I'd like to see more education and we're already starting to see that. And purely from an ethical perspective, um, I, I'd like to see less travel, which we're already seeing. I'd like to see more accessibility, which Sandra, which Sandra spoke to. And it's actually nice that we're seeing less, I, I hope that we'll see less elitism, or as Sandra called it, more democratization um, in terms of how we, how we engage with art. So th those would be on my wish list. Thank you so much. Um, you, you've been nailing some points that really resonate with me. Um, some things that I've been thinking about specifically in the museum space how they acquire work, the departmental divide with artwork. Is it necessary? Um, should art be categorized by continent? Is, is, does that help us? Should art just be categorized by an era, which I think could be way more informative, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, does anyone else wanna answer um, this question before we go to Q&A? Um, we have quite a few questions from people joining in with us. I, Can I, I just make one little point, and I think it's important in the context of South Africa, um, and, and I should have made it earlier. Yeah. If you go to a lot of the South African um, museums, what you will find, in particular in, 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 the, in the 60s during the, the era of apartheid, is you don't find um, the representation of significant black pioneers of, of modern art. And um, that goes to the point that I was making about the importance of insertion. So when I talk about insertion internationally, I also mean it in the context of our own country. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, I, I, I fully support what you said, Pulane, so beautifully. I think adding to that, being based on the continent and seeing the realities that, um, that we're facing here, um, I'm, I'm particularly also concerned about access to technology because those who don't have access to technology, they're gonna be left behind. Um, and that is such a fundamental right, but it's also such a fundamental need for artists across the board and to be able to tell their stories in an authentic way. And what Pulani said is so true about this faddishness that um, artists are creating work which they think that they can sell. And so many artists who are not doing that kind of work are not in necessarily living in the, in the urban centers of, you know, um, Johannesburg or Nairobi or Lagos, um, and they're not, they're not 
at the forefront of some of the, the, the reportage that's going on about art. And these are the, these are the authentic stories which we, we need to be able to tell and capture before it's too late. And then I think this COVID has really opened up our hearts, as Pulani said, there's a spiritual revival. And for me, I think that there's a need for more collaboration. I mean, I'm looking at Kenneth and Pulani, we've both spoken at events, but have we ever, have we ever collaborated? And I look at also the, the, you know, the rich collections on the continent that are not accessible, that we don't even know much about, which have such masterpieces and the need for collectors to open up their collections, the need for us to share more, to support each other more as custodians, as patrons, and, in, and get inspiration from each other. Um, there, you know, I mean, as collectors, there, there's a point of competition, but there's a deeper point of nation building um, and building up the, 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 the African spirit. And, you know, in, in, you know we, we talk about Africa and a lot of people think Africa is a continent. And I always say Africa is an attitude. It's a spirit, <laughs> it's, it's a perspective. And if you have that heartbeat, wherever you are, whether you're in Trinidad or in LA or in Lagos or in uh, Canada, wherever you are, if you have that heartbeat, you should be contributing to the better understanding, representation, and celebration of that heartbeat, the celebration of what it means to be African. Um, and so that collaborative Ubuntu, that spirit of togetherness, I think COVID has been able to bring that out, the need for more of that, both in terms of meeting our basic needs, um, which again, I mean, in terms of, you know, COVID and healthcare, access to healthcare and all of that. But then artists have a way of helping to lift our spirits during these times of great suffering. Um, and so that, that working together, I would like to see more of. Absolutely, um, absolutely. We have- Can I, can I quick, quickly say something? I just, yes. I know we're right we, have, we have time for one question after this and I really like this question. So absolutely, okay. Kenneth, I'd love to hear uh, from yeah, you. Super, super quick, just to follow on, on uh, Pulana and, 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 and Sandra's, this will just take one minute. I just really want to say, and this is kind of my manifesto, in, in my world, it's a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, you know, I'm in a culture, in a place here in North America where, you know, as a black collector, I'm a total island. You know, I mean, being on that Tate African Acquisitions Committee was a big eye opener for me in terms of finding and meeting other black collectors. My, my hope and my dream is, you know, I really want more black collectors. We have a lot of black artists now. Now we need to control how the stories are told, where they're shown. So we need institutional space. We need, we need more black collectors. We need more black gallery directors. We need more black owners of galleries. We, we actually, you know, this is the, the, the place that I'm at now. I'm, I'm really talking deeply about institutional change. You know, in Toronto here, at the AGO, you know, we have uh, a pretty wonderful curator, Julie Crooks, uh, who's African Canadian, and she's, you know, pushing hard uh, along with myself and trying to acquire work so that the collection broadens and we tell a fuller story for an audience that uh, we really need to, you know, an audience that needs to see itself reflected in, in the institution. So my personal hope is that we, we keep our foot on the gas in this moment. And, and ensure that, you know, the institutions and the galleries, um, you know, kind of will, will tell the story uh, and, and that we, we own that, that story and that we, we in some way contribute to the scholarship ourselves, all right? No, absolutely. You and Polani and Sandra kind of touched on this, the beauty of this time, the time to stop, reflect, assess and start creating the change. So absolutely, we do need to see more equity um, within the art world, more, more ownership. So I have a question from someone joining us today. They said, what advice do you have for a young African 
very much willing to start collecting with a relatively small budget and a lot of passion. You, you got to buy emerging artists' work. <laughs> Don't get caught up in that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I why are you I buying that half a million dollar work? <laughs> That's not how I, I start. You know, you gotta, you know, <laughs> start where you're comfortable. I would, I would say that the most important thing is that you have passion, and um, that's critical. So, welcome to the. The, the world of collecting. I would certainly encourage you to start collecting, irrespective of what your budget is. My principal advice is that. And I wish I had been given this advice uh, when I started collecting, is that what is helpful is to actually decide on a mission. In other words, work out what you're passionate about, or alternatively, by collecting, what challenge are you trying to deal with, or what vacuum are you seeking to close, or what issue are you seeking to deal with? What that helps you then do is to put together a mission statement for your collection. And I know it sounds as though I'm speaking as a corporate person, but it is vitally important to have a sense of what your mission is. Because what that does is it focuses the mind, it, it enables you to uh, constantly come back to center, given the fact that there is so much out there. Um, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't admire and enjoy everything that is on offer, but in terms of when you get tempted to buy something that is out of your, your, the, the, the framework of your mission, you are able to hold back. And um, you start with the small, small purchases, obviously, and as you, as you develop your, your, your collection, I would say that it's important to collect deep. And by that I mean, uh, that if you identify one artist who you believe um, is important who's, and whose work you really like, to perhaps collect one piece of their work with every exhibition or body of work that, that they produce. Because that way, you are not only building your, your collection in a manner that is sub substantial, but you're also supporting that artist, uh, that artist as they seek to develop and create more art. I'd say, so for me, those are the two things. Having a mission statement, which you look at from time to time, and give yourself permission, by the way, to nuance it, to change it as, as, as your collection grows. But secondly, to also collect um, deeply. And maybe have a limit, uh, have a sense of how many pieces of art you ultimately are looking to collect um, every year or throughout uh, in terms of building your collection. Did you guys get that mission statement and yeah. a little bit of passion? Okay. Lots of That's passion. Great. Lots think, of passion. I think for me, it's been a lot of passion. Um, and I think that um, I always like to tell this little story about my mother who, um, you know, was, was a travel agent, didn't have a huge income, um, but loved arts. And um, we were living in Eastern Nigeria and the British Council in 1978 put on an exhibition, you know, um, of um, a professor, actually was a lecturer at the time, who was doing some really interesting works in ceramics. So she went there and literally loved the pieces and bought five of them. And it was about 30 years later that, um, you know, my husband and I were saying, wow, mom, you have a lot of really nice Elanatsui early works, which, you know, he's now um, so sought after. So I think um, it always starts with, with, with passion and, 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 and loving an artwork. And then as your, ex as your collection grows, yes, then you become a lot more strategic and try to fill in the gaps. Very nice. One, one of the other things that um, I did um, early on is that I attended as many courses as I, as I possibly could. And interestingly enough, one of the places where, um, two, one of the, the, the one place where I found had very handy, easy to understand courses were the auction houses. 
So I registered for a course at Sotheby's um, where I learned a significant amount, by the way, about African art, not only South African art, but art from the rest of the continent, um, but also from uh, a South African um, auction house, uh, Strauss and Co. here in South Africa, um, which again gave me great insights into South African historic art. Um, uh, and so I, I, it, it gave me a real understanding um, of what was going on during the apartheid era. And as a result of going to um, some of the talks at Strauss, there are some artists who on principle, I won't buy because I feel that they were too close to the apartheid regime. But then by the same token, there are others that I didn't know about um, who I have subsequently uh, bought uh, the work of. Wonderful. We have time for one more question. Um, this next question says, what are you as collectors doing to build up the infrastructure of the African art sectors, including the support of black owned galleries on the continent? Can you ask the question again? Absolutely. What are you as collectors doing to build up the infrastructure of the African art sectors, including the support of black owned galleries on the continent? Um, I think what's yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think what's interesting is that there have been a lot of artist-led initiatives which have grown organically over the last little while. So the 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 traditional infrastructure of a gallery um, is becoming less needed, especially also with working remotely the focus is on education and knowledge and access to it and access to 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 technology much more so than in building the infrastructure which now is is empty in many places so i think we should be focusing on strengthening education um strengthening um access to to technology um, of many artists um, and then again working with the private sector because honestly the, the government is not doing what it's supposed to be doing so it's up to us as as collectors and as as private sector um, um, actors and um, and um, activists to try to to provide new platforms for art to be seen um, and I've been doing that also at a at a at a hotel here in Lagos where a lot of people go for meetings and so on to try to present art outside these traditional gallery spaces. I think that's important. We need to put more art into the public space and into places where people congregate and, and make it less elite. I think we've spoken about elitism, but it's, it's a very, very important thing. So in terms of how do we bring art into more on more platforms, Sorry, Kenneth, go ahead. Yeah, just quickly. So um, in the entire time that I've been collecting over 25 years now, back in 1997, uh, I started a parallel uh, nonprofit arts organization called Wedge Curatorial Projects, again, for wedging artists into the mainstream. And it started as a gallery in my home. It was sort of wedge-shaped. And that, that uh, program, that that nonprofit has really grown over the years. And now we get support, corporate support uh, from TD Bank here in, in uh, Canada and others. And, you know, that has grown from a mission that was really about bringing the global local. And, you know, I can remember showing Sedu Keita, you see here back in year 2000. Um, and, 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 you know, the first solo show in, in Canada. And then it's become the local going global now. So in the last five to 10 years, Wedge Curatorial Projects has really been increasingly about bringing forth emerging African Canadian artists. So through my nonprofit, we're trying to kind of pull people into the fold. As my late father said, you know, lifting as we rise. So that's, that's the important mission. Um, I think, you know, as you collect, there's this other parallel journey you have to have to pull more of the artists that you're passionate about 
into the mainstream so that you know they also will be collected and ultimately become uh, part of uh, institutions and part of the, the canon of, uh, of art. Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, I think I absolutely agree with Sandra and Kenneth. I think um, education and technology are key um, in terms of uh, um, growing the art sector, supporting black galleries, supporting, supporting artists. You made a point, Sandra, about the fact that government does nothing and therefore the private sector, sectors should step in. I absolutely agree with you that the private sector should step in, but I fundamentally believe that as art activists, we should be calling government to account. In particular, in our, on our continent, so often we've let government and ministers off the hook. That should come to an end. That, that's the one point I want to make. The other is, the one thing I must say I'll miss is the fact that um, uh, in South Africa, we have two art seasons, one art season uh, in February in Cape Town and another in Johannesburg um, in September. One of the things I'll miss about September, of course, is that a very good friend of mine, Mandla Sebeko, who runs and owns um, Art Joe Work, first, first, um, first black person to own an art fair in South Africa's history, which is, uh, I think, um, uh, worthy of great praise. Um, his art, his, his outreach program during um, the art fairs, I think is something to speak of. And um, I'm, I'm really sad that to the extent that we move to a more technology-based um, uh, art world, the, the, the opportunity to, to engage with and to educate and to um, uh, create live accessibility of artworks uh, to school going children uh, to young adults uh, will be lost uh, so i hope that um, certainly the, the art the art fairs the art fair scene insofar as education is concerned is not doesn't lose um, that educational aspect to it um. I'm honored to be a part of this chat with you all. Um, I've learned so much and I'm sure our viewers have as well. Um, you all are doing such meaningful work and we appreciate you. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kalani. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you to um, 154 Art Fair for um, allowing us to have this wonderful conversation. I hope everyone has a good day and we'll speak soon. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Chella. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great to talk with everyone.